This week has been an interesting one. We had a G7 meeting with President Biden and a bunch of his pals meeting over in Europe to uh, declare war on Russia, essentially, financially. They just went and stole $300 billion from Russia. We'll get back to that in a moment. It doesn't sound so bad until you look at the details of the fact that we've never stolen money in this way from North Korea who operates death camps. Uh, we've never stolen money from uh, Cuba like this or Venezuela. When you look at the really nasty countries that we've never stooped so low to violating international law in this way, and suddenly we're doing it to Russia. All right, so we have the G7 meeting over in Europe, but then over in Russia, we have an interesting meeting that also took place. The BRICS foreign ministers gathered together now, BRICS, of course, stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Now, we have a few new members that came on on January 1st, you know, because five is not enough. They decided to add six more, but actually only five joined because Argentina quit before they actually got inducted. Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and UAE. So these countries have joined the other countries. So now we're looking at the BRICS 10 versus the G7. So who is the G7? France, Germany, Italy, Canada, United States, and Japan and UK, seven. Of course, at the meeting, they also had the European, uh, European Union people there. So um, in a lot of the photos and stuff like that, you'll see nine people sitting there. Um, and uh, the reason for that is because the European Union is basically just kind of allowed to join in. So anyway, the G7 meeting, uh, all the countries came together and said, let's meddle more with international finance. Let's use our positional authority in banking to screw over the countries that we don't like. And for those very same reasons, all those countries that we don't like decided to gather together and say, how can we avoid getting screwed by the United States and its allies? countries like India, China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan. Pakistan is not officially a member yet, but we're talking about 42 countries are waiting to join the BRICS alliance. And the BRICS alliance is not just like this cool little group where maybe they kind of sit and talk about. They're trying to launch their own currency that is not the U.S. dollar. They want to establish uh, a banking system that is outside the SWIFT dollar system, which everybody has been using happily for quite a while, until the United States decided to use it as a weapon to bash people that we don't like. The BRICS countries are like, we've had it, we're done, we don't want to play by your rules anymore, we want an even playing field. We want a separate system that if you don't like what we're doing, we can just use this other system. So we have to speculate about a bunch of the countries that are looking at joining. But when we start looking at places like Libya, when we start looking at places like Algeria, uh, when we start looking at places like North Korea, when we start looking at Cuba, all these countries that have been sanctioned for a very long time, you had better believe they want in on BRICS. They're like, put us on your banking system so that we can start moving money around, we can start paying for things, we can start shipping things around. And in the spirit of cooperation, they did make an announcement this week. Um, G7's like, we're going to st steal $300 billion of Russian assets. Uh, whereas the BRICS countries are like, let's work together on the International North-South Corridor. Now, this has been in plans for a while. The Chinese have built up the port uh, Chabahar uh, in southern Iran. So it's in southern Iran, it's outside the Strait of Hormuz uh, on the Indian Ocean. And the idea is that uh, Russia can ship things uh, through the Caspian Sea, I think it is, um, to uh, Iran and then across Iran by rail down to Chabahar uh, where they then put things on the ships. And then um, pr what they're really talking about here is they're going to ship 73 0.2 million tons of Russian coal through the uh, International North-South Corridor uh, through Iran 
to get it to India. So interesting, you see Russia is going to supply the coal. Iran is going to supply the trains uh, to get through Iran. China built the port and India is going to buy the coal. That sounds like some international cooperation for the benefit of all, right? China wants that port so it can use it as a, uh, a military port. Uh, so they gave loans to Iran that they know that they'll never actually be able to pay back. But China is dipping its uh, finger in the pie right there too. But the fact is that we have 42 countries waiting to get into BRICS because everyone is sick and tired of the United States messing around. Now, I looked in to see if Indonesia is, is wanting to get on with the BRICS countries, which would be another serious blow. Uh, when you look at the most populous countries in the world, China, India, India is the most populous right now. Um, United States is up there, but Indonesia is also up there. Uh, Indonesia is a very large population country. And uh, so you have Russia, United States, Indonesia kind of running about the same. These, uh, so where Indonesia goes is not a small point. It is a big point. So the fact that BRICS is already up to 10 countries right now, and they say they have 42 countries waiting on the list. Turkey has announced that they are pursuing membership, which is a really big deal. They have the largest standing army in the Middle East. And the Turkish army is part of NATO. So a country that's in NATO joining BRICS we're not sure how that's going to work out, but I'm sure the United States is really not going to like it. Remember back when Turkey was like trying to buy the S-400 uh, missile uh, system from uh, Russia, and, and at the same time they're trying to buy the, uh, the, <laughs> the F-35 from the United States, and we're like, no, you can't do that. You can't have both their missile system and our stealth fighter. You can't like be doing that so you can figure out like how to detect this stealth fighter, right? So we're like, well, you have to pick or choose. You can't, you can't have both. You have to either get their weapon systems and, and just play with them, or you can be on our system. You can't have both, right? And so Turkey's been kind of trying to play both sides of the fence for a while. Turkey is getting increasingly frustrated with the United States and with all of our meddling. And uh, they're kind of shifting more and more over towards Russia. Russia really wants Turkey. Not only because Turkey has a major military, uh, a majorly powerful military, Turkey and Greece are going up button heads. Um, they're often shooting at each other and trying to ram each other's ships and stuff. They really don't like each other. They got some territorial disputes and there's some deep bad blood between the two of them. So uh, Turkey is naturally uh, already kind of against NATO a bit because uh, Greece is part of NATO. But Turkey is technically in NATO, too. And the United States really wants Turkey. And one of the reasons why they really want Turkey is because, uh, I forget the straight name, um, basically, uh, this, Turkey is cut in half, right? Because you got the, uh, the Bosphorus. That's, I think it's the, the Bosphorus. Uh, that's how you get from the Black Sea down to the Mediterranean, is you have to go right through Turkey. And it's, a very, it's almost like a river. It's like a big river. Okay, but you can take ships up and down through there. You could theoretically take an aircraft carrier uh, up there, but we're not allowed to bring our aircraft carrier into the Black Sea. Uh, but Russia is allowed to bring its warships in and out by treaty. And so naturally, Russia is very sensitive about who controls the Bosphorus. And the fact that NATO controls the Bosphorus right now really has them upset. So they really want Turkey to join BRICS and be on their team. And the United States, of course, really wants those military bases in, um, in southern um, Turkey against the Syrian border. So uh, we've got Incirillic down there, a major military base where we apparently have nuclear weapons uh, staged. And uh, a lot of operations in the Middle East are flown out of there. So that's, uh, that's a big deal. We want that air base there. We want to keep it. It's a very, very big deal. Anyway, so let's get back to what the G7 did. So the G7 decided to steal $300 billion of frozen Russian ass, uh, state and private assets. Now, once again, like I said, that sounds okay. The United States and its allies 
when, when there's an issue with a country um, like North Korea or Cuba or Venezuela, whenever somebody starts massacring their own people and committing genocide and general acts like that, we tend to freeze all their assets so they can't access their money, right? But it would be an act of war to reach in there and take the money, right? You can't do that. With, I mean, that's a declaration of war. Now, technically, we're at war with North Korea. We never actually signed a peace treaty with North Korea. We signed an armistice, which was kind of like, you stay over there, we'll stay over here. We won't put too many troops on the peninsula. You guys aren't allowed to do certain things. And in that way, we won't shoot at each other. Okay, with this agreement, we won't shoot at each other. But we're still technically at war. So we're at war with North Korea, but have we ever seized their frozen assets? And the answer is no, no, we haven't. Because that would be wrong. North Korea, who has death camps that are on par with the Holocaust, and this is coming from Auschwitz survivors, okay, a, a judge, um, a European judge who was an Auschwitz survivor heard the testimonies of the things that were happening that are happening right now in the North Korean death camps. And uh, he said that uh, that was on par or even worse than uh, the death camps like Auschwitz during World War II. Um, so we're talking about war crimes on a scale, uh, human, hu human rights abuses on a scale uh, not really seen in human history since Mao and China and Stalin and Russia and the mustache guy in, you know, Europe. So really, big, really big deal. But has the United States reached in and seized those assets? Nope, nope, has not. Remember how we froze all those Iranian assets? But then Obama decided to give them to Iran. Why didn't we seize them? We're, we're basically at war with Iran. Like, what? why didn't we seize those assets? They're really bad people over there, right? Nope, we didn't seize them because we're like, this is your money. We realize that international law and banking, you know, we respect the rights of countries that you don't just go and take people's money. You don't just go and um, pillage national assets and stuff like that, even if you really, really, really don't like those countries. So we didn't take Iran's money. We didn't take North Korea's money. We didn't take Cuba's money. We didn't take Venezuela's money. But we're taking Russia's money, who we're not at war with. See a problem with that? Well, Russia has said that if they do this, that Russia was going to start seizing European assets uh, on their side of the border. And uh, they're going to basically hit Europe with a whole bunch of seizures uh, of money. Now, only about five of that $300 billion uh, is in the United States. Now, we've already moved and taken that, uh, which was chump change. Most of this money is sitting in Belgium. Belgium has decided to agree with the G7. It's not even why the G7s. And that's why the European Union guys are there. Um, they agreed to go along with the United States and seize all this money. Like I said, Russia has said that they were going to hit back financially, that they're going to seize a whole bunch of um, European uh, companies and such in, in Russia, and they're just going to take them over uh, in retribution for this. And so we should be seeing that in the next couple of days. Major escalations out there, and mark my words, every other country in the world is going... Do I really want to put my money in European banks right now? Because maybe they won't, maybe tomorrow or maybe some future date, they're not going to like something that I'm doing in my country. My money's not safe in those banks, in those Swiss banks, in the Belgian banks, in the banks of New York. They're not safe there. If the money's not in my pockets, if it's not in physical assets like <clears throat> gold, then it can be taken from me. Until there is an alternative system out there like the BRICS system, which is being set up as we speak, 
Uh, China has already established its own banking system. Russia has established its own banking system. Iran has set up a banking system, which is a little more laughable. Um, but a number of these countries have set up banking systems and the idea is that they're gonna start uh, connecting them together into one network where they can transfer money from country to country. Right now they're transferring in local currencies. They're gonna accept an exchange rate uh, from my country to your country, and then we're going to agree on how much that is, and then we're going to uh, basically uh, text each other to how much money has gone from me to you, and then that's kind of how they're transferring money at this point. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be sending plane loads of cash back and forth, or if they're just going to have like a, uh, a tally system, but basically they have these hubs uh, where the scorekeeper says, okay, you actually owe me money because you transferred money to that guy over there. And then those guys transferred money over to these guys over here. So therefore um, you owe me money and I owe these people over here money. And so that you got the central authorities kind of playing this, this like game as the bankers. And so this is international money transfers that are happening right now. This is how Russia is selling coal to India. This is how Russia is doing business with other countries. We've forced them off of our banking system. And so now they are inventing a new banking system. And Saudi Arabia being part of the BRICS countries, is it any wonder that they've agreed to start accepting currencies other than the US dollar out there? And that is truly the end of the petrodollar. Because there was only one thing that the US dollar was really good for was that it was the only way you could buy Saudi Arabian oil. And now you can use other currencies. Friends, things are changing out there and uh, they're not for the better. The United States is in decline. We're losing our grip on the world. We're being piloted by a bunch of maniac, maniacal, um, power hungry idiots. That's what's happening out there. They don't realize how much they're breaking everything down. All of our advantages are disappearing. Our empire is crumbling. And friends, we have been benefiting from that for a very long time. If you're in the United States or if you're in one of the countries that's allied with the United States, we have been benefiting from that for a very long time. And those benefits are gonna stop real fast. And uh, we're gonna start feeling the effects of the inflation and the money printing much, much more. We've been offloading that inflation to the rest of the world and the world is pushing back now. And those concentrated effects of inflation are gonna be concentrated in the United States more and more. And we're gonna see that spin up faster and faster as people dump the dollar and we're gonna see the prices go through the roof like you can't even imagine. Weimar Republic, here we come. All right, friends, thanks so much for watching. Um, if you want to check out another video from this channel, there's one right up here. I'll see you over there, or I'll see you guys later. Steve Poplar of the Poplar Report, out.